In this video, we're going to see some examples of control structures in Java. Control structures are one of the most important features of any programming language because they're, they're what allow us to add logic and decision making to our code. So these include things like if then else statements and loops. So to start off with, I, I created some variables and I have this scanner object and I'm going to use that scanner object to read input from the user. So if I run this, if I enter an integer, great, then it exits because all it does is it reads the integer and then it exits. One thing to keep in mind is whenever you have a scanner object, that scanner object has a resource. And you'll notice when I delete the close, I have a warning here that says resource leak. My scanner is never closed. And anytime you see those orange things on the side, usually you should try to resolve them. At the very least, you should understand what they mean. And from there, you can decide if it's something you really need to address or not. But you should always bias yourself toward, I'm going to fix it so that that warning disappears. Again, the goal is not to dis make the warning disappear. The goal is to fix the problem that that warning is indicating. OK, so our first control structure is going to be an if then else statement. What that does is it allows us to give a condition. Now, this is a simple condition. We're just doing a comparison. But you could have considerably more complicated decisions that said if with ands and ors and so forth and not as well. But in this case, if this condition is true, whatever it is, then this code will execute. And otherwise, this code will execute. And I don't really like leaving out the braces, even though for one line, it's fine. It, it'll work. But it's really common to accidentally add some additional lines. And if you do that, only that very first line is part of the loop. And so, or is part of the condition block. And so if you leave out those braces and add additional lines, the logic of your code will change. So even though it's not necessary, I like to add those. Now, there's other times where we have multiple different things that can happen. So here we have something that's either true or false. But we can use a switch statement to check for different possibilities. So here we're doing a switch on B, which B is the number that we, we read in. And we're saying here, if B is 1, then we're going to print you entered a 1. If it's 2, so on and so forth, until we get to this default case. And this will happen if nothing else previously has, has matched. And in that case, we'll say you entered a number greater than 4 or less than 1. Now, one other thing to notice here are these breaks statements. We need these because each case will cascade to the next case once it's completed. So if this case is true and there's no break, it'll continue printing all the code that's here. And there's some tricks you can do that make use of that. But in general, for each case, put your break here and then it'll jump out of the switch. So you'll only execute that one line of code. It's also always good to have a default case because you never know if You've captured all the cases you need to up here. And that's a switch statement. So now we're going to talk about control structures that deal with loops. And the first one of those will be a while loop. And a while loop executes a block of code as long as some condition is true. So here, as long as ii is less than or equal to b, then we're going to execute this loop. And the loop prints a number, it prints the variable ii, and then it increments ii. So you'll notice eventually this loop will exit because no matter how big b is, as we continue adding to ii, it will eventually catch up and eventually be bigger. Now, one thing to notice is that this loop will not execute if ii is less than or equal to b to start off with. So when we want the body of the loop to execute at least once, we can use a do while loop. Now, a do while loop, notice it starts off with do, and our condition is here after the loop. So it's always going to execute at least once. Then it evaluates the condition. If the condition is still true, then we will execute the body of the loop again. If it's false, the loop exits. So this gives us another way to control the loop, and, it, and that way we don't have to copy. Uh, sometimes you'll see the, the body of the while loop copied once, and then a while loop or a for loop afterwards. And you can use it, that's for cases where you want to execute that code at least once. Well, a do while loop allows us to clean our code up a little bit to say, hey, look, I want to make sure that this loop, it runs at least once. 
And another loop that I'm sure you've seen before is a for loop. And a for loop has this weird syntax where we start off and initialize a variable. And you can declare the variable here if you don't want to reuse one that's already been around. And the stopping condition is going to be the second piece. And in this case, it's ii less than b. And then finally, we need something to change at each iteration. And here we're going to increment ii at each iteration. So this loop will go from 0 while ii is less than b. And we're going to increment it each time. So this is basically a loop where ii will start off with 1 and it'll go all the way up to b minus 1. So it'll execute b times. So let's run our code at this point. So we'll say our integer is 4. And then we can see with this if then else loop, 4 is, uh, let's see, 5 is not less than 4. So we're checking if 5 is less than 4. And then here, when we switch this, uh, since it's 4, we should hit this case and it says you entered a 4. The while loop, we start off with i is 0. And so it's going to go until i i is less than or equal to b. And so you can see that once that's equal to 4, it exits. And then we bring that down. And you'll notice that it starts off this loop variable at 6, which may surprise you because it exited this loop when the loop variable was 4. However, notice once it prints that out, it does add 2 to the variable ii. So when we get here, ii is actually 6. So that's what you see going on here. And in our for loop, you can see it prints out the variable 1, 2, 3, 4. Or I'm sorry, 0, 0, 1, 2, 3. Okay, so those are the control structures themselves. And there's also some ways to work with control structures. So if I started out with just a for loop that looked like this, that would be an infinite loop. And, and hopefully you see why that would be, right? Because I'm not initializing anything. I'm not checking for when I should stop and I'm not doing anything afterwards. So this is basically just gonna run forever. When I have something that could be an infinite loop, I can use a break to actually exit the loop when something happens. So here, inside my for loop, I'm checking that AA is greater than 100. If it is, then I'm going to call break. And what break does is it gets out of the current loop. Once this condition is met, we exit. So to show you that that works, and we'll do 6 so that we can see it uh, that switch case fail as well. Notice it says breaking because it eventually, even though this is an infinite loop, this says get out of the infinite loop. Uh, and just to show you, when we the switch statement, when we entered 6, it says you entered a number greater than 4 or less than 1. So that's our breaks statement. And you'll sometimes see, uh, this is not a very, it's sort of a controversial statement to use. And you should not rely on this. However, I think sometimes there's cases where it can simplify your code to just say, hey, look, I just want to exit this loop. I'm not inherently opposed to you using this, but you just want to make sure you're using it in a in a way that makes your code clearer, not that makes it more difficult to understand. Because what you certainly don't want to do is have a bunch of code with some conditions all over and breaks here and breaks there, and it's hard to under figure out where things are going. But in a case like this, where you have a single loop, you're breaking out of it, I think sometimes that can simplify your code. And that's especially true in cases where you have a lot of conditions you have to check for, and if any of those conditions are met, maybe you want to exit. Well, instead of a long, complicated se series of nested if statements, you can just break out if, if any of those conditions are met. Okay, so the last thing we're going to do is, is sort of related, and it's a continue. Here, I have a loop for ii equals 0, less than or equal to b, ii plus plus. I have this statement that says, if ii mod 3, which means the remainder of ii divided by 3, is not equal to 0, I'm going to continue. After this if condition, I'm going to print. So let's see what happens. And I'm going to do a big number here just so that we can see this happen. So notice... In the continue example, notice it prints 0, 3, 6, 9, 12. And you may notice those are the multiples of 3. Now, the reason that happens is I'm saying, hey, if ii modulo 3 is not 0, I'm going to continue. And what that means is go to the next iteration. It's like a break, but I don't break out of the loop. I break out of that existing loop block and go back to the next iteration. And so this, again, is another thing you can use to clarify your code you just want to use it sparingly and make sure that you're not using it to hide other design decisions. That's a quick run through of the 
control structures you have available to you in your Java program. Again, use these to make your code clearer, not to make it more complicated or complex. A good rule of thumb is use control structures so that you're not indenting your code too much. So here we have like one, two, three, four, five, I think indents. Um, you, know, you don't want to have code that starts way over here. And if you use control structures correctly, you can kind of avoid that and you can make your code easier to follow.